Tore Päivi Puori Tolomot, mun ammalle Jouno Joon Anne Kirsti Räynä. Mun kiihtän tän Etnama Arpevirlas Olomui ja Äikkävi. Mun kiihtän sen vuon ja Ieräihkeillä tahkan tän konferenssa Veolajan. Uh, good morning everyone. My Sami name is Jouno Joon Anne Kirsti Räynä. And it tells exactly uh, which family and who are the people who came before me. The names before my name are my uh, family members before me. My people, uh, the Sami, are the indigenous people currently living in the uh, northern parts of Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland and northwest Russia. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Havasupai, the Soshoni and other uh, native peoples on whose uh, territories we have gathered uh, for this wonderful conference. I, will, uh, I want to thank uh, Jen Vaughan for enabling this conference to take place for us to gather here today and all the organizers who have made it uh, happen. They've worked really hard. I've uh, observed them working really hard for the past several days. I also want to thank all of the speakers, all the women who have spoken before me, both uh, today and last night. Last but not least, I also want to uh, give thanks to the gifts of uh, the land, water and uh, air, without which none of us would be here today. The topic of my paper is enabling the gift logic of indigenous uh, philosophies, and uh, it's part of my uh, PhD thesis that I just recently completed. And the structure of my uh, paper takes the following form. First, I uh, discuss very briefly uh, my starting point, which is that the gift uh, is a central aspect of the land-based worldviews of many indigenous peoples. Uh, and then I uh, give a, a very briefly a couple of examples from the Sami worldview and its gift practices. I then take a, a look how give, uh, gift and giving back, uh, give back philosophies have become an important part of contemporary indigenous uh, scholarship. Uh, fourth, I address uh, the question of the gift as a threat in mainstream modern society and its institutions, particularly the academy. Finally, I su suggest that in order to forge a new paradigm and a relationship between dominant and previously marginalized ways of knowing and perceiving the world, the so-called other worldviews must be recognized as a gift. I also consider uh, what recognition means in, this, uh, in the context of indigenous philosophies. It is a well-established argument that the gift functions primarily as a system of social relations, forming alliances, solidarity, communities, and binding collectivities together. What is often ignored, however, is that the gift in indigenous worldviews extends beyond interpersonal relationships to what is called all my relations. Put another way, according to these philosophies, giving is an active relationship between human and natural words based on a close interaction of sustaining and renewing balance between them through gifts. Instead of viewing uh, the gift as a form of exchange or having only an economic function, I argue that the gift uh, is a reflection of a particular worldview characterized by the perception of the natural environment as a living entity which gives its gifts and abundance to people if it's treated with respect and gratitude. In other words, if it's treated uh, uh, responsibly, if certain responsibilities are observed. Central to this perception is that the world as a whole is constituted of uh, an infinite web of relationships extended to and incorporated into the entire social uh, condition of the individual. Social ties apply to everybody and everything, including the land. People are related to their physical and natural surroundings through genealogies, oral traditions, their personal and collective experiences pertaining to these uh, various locations. According to the traditional Sami perception of the world, like in many other world, indigenous worldviews, the land is a physical and spiritual entity uh, which humans are part of. 
As survival has depended on the balance and renewal of the land, the central principles in this understanding are sustainable use of and respect for the natural realm. The relationship with the land is maintained by collective and individual rituals in which the gift and giving back are integral. The intimacy and interrelatedness is reflected in the way of communicating with various aspects of the land, which often are addressed as relatives. The close connection to the natural realm is also evident in the permeable and indeterminate, uh, indeterminate boundaries between the human and natural worlds. Skilled individuals can assume the form of an animal when needed, and there are also stories about women marrying an animal. An interesting, almost completely ignored aspect in the analysis of Sami cosmology and uh, uh, religion, as it's sometimes called, is the role of female deities in give, uh, giving the gift of life to both human beings and domestic animals, including reindeer, and the connection to the land. One can suggest that the Sami deity Mattarahka, with her three daughters, signified the very foundation of the Sami cosmic order, for they are the deities of new life, who convey the soul, a soul of the child, create its body, and also uh, uh, assist with menstruation, childbirth, and protection uh, of children. Thus, the most significant, significant gift of all, a new life, was the duty of these female deities that are that in ethnographic literature have been relegated to mere status of wives of male deities, of course reflecting the uh, patriarchal bias of these interpretations. Moreover, Mattarahka could be translated as Earth Mother. Uh, the root Mattar refers to Earth and also ancestors. Initially, she could, be, uh, she could have been an indiv individual ancestress Moreover, words as the Sami words for earth and mother uh, also derive from the Sami uh, for the same roots, Eanan and Atni, respectively. Traditionally, one of the most important ways to maintain established relations and the social cosmic order has been practice of giving to various Sietis. Sieti, a sacred place of uh, a gift, consists of a stone or a piece of wood to which the gift is given to thank certain spirits for the abundance in the past, but also to in ensure fishing, hunting, and reindeer luck in the future. Although the several uh, centuries long influence of Christianity has severely eroded Sami gift giving uh, to and sharing with land by banning its a pagan form of devil worshiping, there is a rel relatively large uh, body of evidence that the practice of sage gifting is still practiced. A central principle of indigenous philosophies, giving back, also forms the backbone of current research conducted by many indigenous scholars and students. It expresses a strong commitment and desire to ensure, ensure that academic knowledge, practices, and research are no longer used as a tool of colonization and as a way of exploiting indigenous peoples by taking uh, their knowledge without even giving anything back in return. After centuries of being studied, measured, categorized, and represented to, ser to serve various colonial interests and purposes, many indigenous peoples now require that research dealing with indigenous issues has to emanate from the needs and concerns of indigenous communities instead of those of an individual researcher or the dominant society. Indigenous research ethics assert the expectations of academics, both indigenous and non-indigenous, to give back, to conduct research that has positive outcome and is relevant to indigenous peoples themselves. The principle of giving back in research, whether it is rep reporting back, sharing the benefits, bringing back new knowledge and vital information to the community, or taking the needs and concerns of the people into account, is part of, part of the larger process of decolonizing uh, colonial structures and mentality and restore, restoring indigenous societies. Besides generating uh, respectful and responsible scholarship, the recognition of the gift of indigenous uh, epistemes or worldviews also provides 
uh, it with a deeper, more informed understanding of contemporary indigenous state uh, relations manifested in numerous and complex ways, as well as of the different perceptions of the world, which emphasize the relationships uh, between human beings and the natural environment. Considering the destructive uh, agendas of unlimited economic growth uh, based on prevailing neoliberal global capitalist and patriarchal uh, paradigms labeled as free, tra free trade and commodification of all life forms is yet another reason for the academy and the mainstream society at large to recognize and become cognizant of the main principles of indigenous philosophies. The gift in indigenous societies encompasses numerous spheres and therefore interpretations of the gift as exchange or economy or both are limited and biased. Normativization of these interpretations has influenced even many indigenous perceptions of the gift, rendering them into a form of exchange and forced reciprocity within the neoliberal framework of modern economics, implying the impossibility of a true or pure gift. There is a long history of not only neglecting and making the gift invisible, but also demonizing and pathologizing it. Uh, as the anti potlatch law against the gift practices in northwest coast uh, of Canada, for example, indicates, the logic of the gift has been considered a threat uh, to the civilization, the so-called civilization, and the establishment of the nation state. The gift as practiced in indigenous societies of the Northwest Coast, where I also currently live, uh, where I did my uh, PhD, became perceived as a threat to uh, the emerging Canadian nation state, and in particular, the values it represented and wanted to represent. The gift of the potlatch institution was asso associated with excess and waste, and people practicing it were defined as the ultimate other of Europe by the colonial administrators. What the early government uh, agents experienced on the northwest coast of the newly emerged nation was a quote, a practice that Western civilization wants above all to exclude from itself, the practice of non-productive expenditure as it manifested in gambling and giving away. End of quote. Gift giving in the form of potlatches signified a threat to the emerging civilization and progress. A former Hudson Bay uh, Company trader, George Blenkinsop, reported that, quote, until the local Indians were cured of their propensity for potlatching, there can be little hope of elevating them from their present state of degradation. End of quote. He formulated his remarks within a set of opposing terms of high and low, elevation and degradation, civilization and barbarism. From the point of the view of the gift, it is interesting that what marks the limit between these contradictory terms is not the feast, but the notion of exp expenditure. The early colonial authorities were aware of the problematic nature of the kind of giving, uh, of the kind of giving that did not comply to their values and notions of progress. Paradoxically, if the gift in native communities of the Northwest Coast had been interpreted merely as a form of exchange, it might, have, I, it might not have been perceived as dangerous and threatening enough to be outlawed. But the colonial state authorities saw the power of the gift of the potlatch and how it represented a potential interruption and subversion. The only way to be protected from this potential threat was to ban it and uh, declare it impossible by law. It may not, uh, therefore, be a mere unfortunate coincidence that the gift of indigenous epistemes is currently, uh, currently not recognized in the academy. The gift of indigenous epistemes may still appear for some as a threat or disruption. It may threaten existing structures and discourses and the current status quo. To echo uh, Hopi Miwok uh, writers Wendy Rose's remarks, someone might be benefiting from not recognizing and receiving the gift and from not, in, um, from not engaging in a new logic of reciprocal relation, responsibility 
and relationship of hospitality. One of the central arguments uh, in my uh, dissertation is that what I call epistemic ignorance, the lack of knowledge in the academy and elsewhere in, in mainstream society toward other worldviews results in a situation where indigenous people are not heard or understood by the academy when they speak through their own epistemological conventions. To address this problem, I suggest a paradigm in which indigenous epistemes needed to be regarded as a gift. In the current context, the gift of indigenous uh, uh, epistemes remain impossible in the academy. It is not only received and refused, but even its, its existence is not recognized. If the gift remains unnoticed and impossible, indigenous people continue, continue to be inscribed and positioned as generalized native informants in the service of the uh, production of hegemonic, hegemonic elite knowledge. The gift, is not only, gift not only fails, but it is misconstructed, appropriated and consumed as commodity. In short, the gift remains impossible in current uh, circumstances in the academy. The gift continues posing a threat to the prevailing modes of thinking and interaction that characterize the contemporary transnational patriarchal capitalism in the same way that Potlatch, for example, posed earlier a threat to the civilization and the merging nation state of Canada. As Derrida contends, there is a gift, if there is any, only uh, what interrupts the system. One of the reasons for the Academy not to recognize the gift, uh, and also larger society, uh, is the fear of, inter fear of interruption and ambiguity, loss of control, erasure of boundaries, such as disciplinary boundaries, excess of endless relativity. The gift may threaten the hegemony and hierarchy of epistemes which serve certain interests. One reason to prohibit the gift is also that the current academy is deeply rooted in the ideology of exchange economy. In the current system, indigenous epistemes are not regarded as gifts, but as something else such as intellectual property, as already discussed by Mililani. In some cases, they are appropriated and exploited for economic purposes or to fulfill the spiritual need of others. I'm skipping here a little bit. I go to talk about the recognition now. For some scholars, such as uh, Jacques Derrida, the gift is annulled when it's uh, recognized. I maintain, however, that in indigenous philosophies, it is the very recognition that makes the gift possible. In a system where the logic of the gift does not only imply earning the gift or owing something to the giver, and where the formation of the relationship through gift giving is not considered in negative terms, such, a bur such as a bur burdensome obligation, or a loss of one's individuality and independence, but a condition of a balanced existence and ultimately part of one's identity, the gift cannot be ignored or rendered something else. In this kind of system and social order, the failure to recognize and receive the gift results uh, in the disappearance of the gift, which in turn means that the relationships formed through the gift are weakened and ultimately lost. Besides recognition as a form of validating identities or recognizing existing collective historical rights, I think there is a need to consider another dimension to this idea of recognition, a dimension that is embedded in the gift logic with regard to indigenous people's relationship to the land. In this framework, recognition is a condition for survival. It stems from the philosophy according to which the well-being of all is dependent on the social, social cosmic balance. Therefore, nothing can be taken uh, from the land without acknowledging the intricate and ne necessary relationships that sustain and enable this stability. Within the logic of the gift, recognition is therefore a form of reciprocation, not only between human, but all living beings. Further, it is important to emphasize that these and other uh, practices of recognizing, thanking, and honoring do not uh, belong to the past, as is often thought when discussing indigenous peoples and their cultural practices. 
Also, what is significant in this recognition and reciprocation is that it is not a question of cause and effect. That is a matter of if I take care of land, the land will take care of me or the other way around. Rather, it is a radically different way of understanding and making sense of the world without the need uh, for explanations of ca causality. My argument that indigenous epistemes or worldviews must be perceived as a gift to the academy and elsewhere in society is uh, grounded in a conviction that only in this way it is possible to forge a new relationship between dominant uh, or, or modern uh, Western and the so-called other uh, epistemes, the previously marginalized worldviews. Recognizing that indigenous epistemes are a gift is the first step toward receiving these gifts and therefore also uh, learn, starting to learn the logic, uh, learn and understand the logic of this gift. Only by grasping the logic of the gift, a different way of relating, can we bring forth and call for the recognition of certain concepts such as responsibility and reciprocity as understood and practiced in many indigenous uh, uh, worldviews. There are, however, uh, certain dangers in suggesting that indigenous epistemes need to be perceived as a gift to the academy. The gift is not an exchange, a credit or form of uh, limited give and take, but something which implies unconditionality and other orientation. In the context of long, uh, of long history of, of appropriation, exploitation, and more rec recently, commodification of various forms of indigenous knowledge, uh, the idea of indigenous people giving their epistemes freely without expectations of a return is, uh, may not only uh, be foolish, but risky and dangerous. Further, to propose a free gift may appear to squarely oppose the principles and codes of con conduct formulated by indigenous scholars and communities for the protection of indigenous knowledge. One could even argue that it's entirely unreasonable and inappropriate to suggest that now that indigenous peoples have finally gained some so control over their epistemologies and intellectual property uh, through both their own mechanisms as well as national and international laws and regimes, we should uh, again start giving freely. In the current trend of ac uh, accelerating commodification and com uh, commercialization of academic institutions, Universities not only do observe the logic of a gift, but they are moving to the other extreme where knowledge is increasingly defined as profit. This uh, is one of the many reasons why alternative paradigms and mobilizing discourses are not only welcome, but timely and indispensable. The gift remains impossible in circumstances that do not observe and follow the logic of the gift characterized by commitment and participation in recipro reciprocal relations, uh, reciprocal responsibilities. The gift remains impossible also as long as receiving and giving is framed in terms of owing, as in the idea that academy owes to indigenous peoples or earning, that the idea that uh, society or uh, academy has to earn the gift of indigenous peoples. This kind of terminology distorts and misrepresents the idea of the gift, considering it in terms of the exchange paradigm. In the logic uh, of the gift, gifts are not and cannot be earned. One is given a gift, which is an act followed by a responsibility to recognize it, that is, not for taken for, uh, for granted, and to receive it according to certain responsibilities. Only by understanding the gift as an expression of the responsibility toward, an other, toward the other, we foreground the transformation of dominant patriarchal global capitalist paradigms toward a radically different worldview that is not only possible, but urgently required. Thank you. I just wanted to um, share my language with you and uh, give you a greeting. 
Hvor jeg rest skal falde, jeg er de vis nok sille, har lagt en skidt skal lejle dem hul af kastespos. I'm uh, giving you greetings from all of my family and my community and, and my people, um, the seal, and I'm also giving you my thanks that I'm uh, able to come here to share some words with you, and I wanted to uh, thank Jen uh, for the invitation, and uh, I, I wanted to uh, also acknowledge Leanne in, in um, making the contact uh, for Jen. Um, <clears throat> I, I have, uh, I did prepare a, an abstract which I uh, sent over, um, but I'm an oral speaker, and, um, and so that's how I want to speak with you. And <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, a number of things that may be relevant to uh, the conference here. I want to... Uh, give you some idea of how I think about uh, giving and the idea of uh, gift and uh, I want to um, give you some idea about uh, my own people's understanding of that in, in, um, in terms of the land and the community and, and the family and, and also um, the individual. in order to contribute to this dialogue um, because something is really wrong out there and um, it's the only thing that I can offer and the only thing that I can give is is my thinking and uh, how it might work and how it might be incorporated or how it might be uh, thought of um, in terms of the change that needs to happen is all up to you. Um, I come from um, a uh, small community in, in uh, southern um, part of British Columbia in the interior. It's about maybe 200 miles inland from Vancouver, and about the same parallel. My people are, are um, sometimes referred to as the Okanagan people, but that's the valley, that's the geographic valley that we live in. We're the Nsiilichtjen people, we're Siilich. And um, that's how I refer to myself. The uh, area that I come from has a lot to do with what I'm going to talk about. Um, the area that I come from is uh, one of the only areas in Canada that's considered to be a desert, which means uh, we have very little rainfall during the year because of the two mountain sy systems that, uh, that are on both sides of our valley. And um, it's, it's very, um, the um, ecology is very harsh um, and, and dry in the summertime. And so that means that um, the uh, learning that our people uh, have had to um, accomplish and achieve over many, many generations uh, in order to survive um, has a lot to do with scarcity and has a lot to do with survival. In a land where there, there isn't um, a lot of abundance and, and in a land where um, the fragility of, of the ecosystem requires um, absolute knowledge and care uh, or you overuse it or you um, overextend your use of it, um, it can impact directly on how much you have to eat the next year or the years after in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the survival of your coming generation. So a large part of um, our society and our community and our practice and our philosophy and our governance system are, are based on understanding um, that uh, we need to always be vigilant and aware of uh, not overusing, not overconsuming, and uh, always be aware of uh, sharing um, and giving and always be aware that we're also in everything that we're doing that we're, we're making the same um, possibility uh, available to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And so that's 
um, really an immense kind of responsibility. And I think of it in terms of um, direct connection uh, to how the land operates, how the land gives life, and how you as a, a human being are a part of that. I think that has a lot to do with um, some things that are wrong uh, from my perspective, that uh, the land is um, the body that gives continuously, and we as human beings are simply a part of that. And what indigenous means to me is um, that the, the interdependence of everything that exists there must be understood and I must have knowledge about and I must be able to cooperate with all the other living things on the land so as not to make any one of them extinct or remove any one of them for my need. In other words, to cooperate and to collaborate with every living thing so, so that they can live and I can live in the same level of health so that they can continue giving to me and to my children and my children's children the health that they deserve in being a, a life form. So if indigenous to me can't be without that knowledge and that level of cooperation with the land. You, you cannot call yourself indigenous. Uh, this plant here was indigenous somewhere because it could live on its own in an interdependent relationship with its climate, with its land, with its topography. But once you remove it from there, you have to have all kinds of other things to, to uh, allow it to live all kinds of other kinds of energy and work has to be done to make it live. And this plant no longer is indigenous in this pot, in this room, in this place. Uh, if you took it out there and put it um, in, the, in the desert where we're at now, this plant wouldn't survive the day. And I think of indigenousness in that way. And I think the, of the paradigm shift that's required to uh, recover the ability for human beings to live on the land without the kind of the immensity of destructive support systems that are required um, for this plant or for you. I think of that in terms of uh, the way that all of those systems have been changed in my community uh, in a forced way. I look at community next uh, um, in that sense, um, I, I think about my, my uh, life and I think about uh, how, not only how land gave me my life. Without the Okanagan land, without the, the Seelik land and all of the relatives that live on that land, every single thing that uh, sustained my people as food sustained my people as medicine, sustained my people as clothing and shelter. All of those things that surround us, um, in, I can only express in my language uh, what, that, what meaning that has to me and what meaning that has to be unable to protect that and unable to um, stand between destruction and those things that are becoming um, extinguished from that land uh, because of the depth of, of love and understanding that, that's required for us to, uh, to uh, continue to receive that gift and to continue to honor that gift and respect that gift. Um, it's like um, family members being assaulted with your hands tied. And um, that, I can give you that feeling because you can hear it in my voice, um, is the same with community, is the same with all of the generations of uh, relatives that have sustained each other, interacted with each other in really specific ways uh, to be able to continue life. One of the things about um, the Nsilikchen 
people is that we've, we've been described as an egalitarian uh, society and by some as uh, matriarchal societies. And um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to go into the academic discussions about that. I just want to give you some idea of how our community thinks of itself and how it, how it thinks about uh, what community is. To us, community is a living system like the land. It's a living diversity of uh, beings and that diversity is immensely necessary like the diversity on the land is immensely necessary. There's not one thing on the land that isn't necessary. There's not one thing in the community or one person that isn't necessary um, in, our, in our understanding of it. Uh, it would be like saying, well, I don't, need, uh, I don't need my fingernails or I don't need my toes. Just because you don't use your toes, toes every day or your fingernails every day, um, that every person in the community fulfills a part that may not be understood either in this generation or the next generation or the coming generations. And that in, like every uh, diverse being on the land. And that we have no way of determining which is more important or which is less important. And that we never have um, an understanding in our community members that uh, anyone is actually superior to another. And I think there again I look at uh, how society outside of our traditional community operates and the idea that there is clearly, my grandmother tried to explain to us in a lot of ways that we would have to find a way to be defensive against this that there is clearly an understanding that some people have more of a right than others, that some people have more of a priority to things than others, and that some people not only are born with that, but are born with the control of, of and over that, and that, um, that they live and die with that idea of that privilege, that control, that exclusion of others. And, and I think that part uh, has always been, for me, um, a real difficult thing. I relate to people in a really, I guess, in a really different way in a, in a sense because that, that's how my community relates. Um, I, I can't recognize hierarchies and I don't recognize hierarchies. People are people in terms of how they relate to me. But I notice that on an everyday level, when I go into, say, the, the community that I live next to in Penticton, um, depending on how much money you got and how much money you're going to spend, the amount of, uh, I guess, the amount of uh, respect and I, I don't like to use that word because it's pro a problem for me. Um, the amount of, um, and I'll, but I'll use the word, the amount of respect paid to them um, is uh, really related not to them but to their money and to their power and to their ability to spend. And uh, that's so false. And that's so uh, unhuman and uh, against community. That's so much... Uh, different from our understanding of what what respect is in regard to community. In my community, um, and someone spoke about the idea of chief here earlier, my, in my community, uh, the uh, chief uh, was, we have chiefs in our community, women and men, and the idea of chief has to do with how well that person hears everyone and how well that person understands what is going on that might be wrong, that might be um, cause conflict, that might cause uh, danger to the people. And then the word itself, il michum, means to be able to take the many strands that are moving outward and, and twine them into one, 
one meaning, one people, a unification, a rebalancing with the land. And what that means then is that that person must have an immense ability to feel what the community is saying, an immense ability to listen to the things that have been said and the things that are happening and put that together and say it back to the people. So it's about communication and it's about being able to listen and being able, being able to put it together in a way which everyone says, yeah, that's it. And it's not telling people what to do or leading people or forcing people. It's in being able to verbalize and communicate what everybody else feels and knows and understands and remembers and being able to put that together to, to create a movement forward. And so our, our uh, systems rely on that kind of relationship and communications in our, in our community systems. There's a process that I'm just going to describe to you really briefly, and I'll give you uh, um, an example of, of it. Um, I uh, established an, uh, an educational program to recover um, our traditional practices on the land and in our community and our families called Anaukan. And I've been working at it for 25 years. The idea of Anaukan is, um, is a word that comes from our language. Anaukan is a word that describes how community should operate in terms of that kind of communication. How community should operate in our mind is to be able to include. It's an in, in inclusion-seeking process, which means that rather than exclude the minority, we're we are actually trying to find ways to help minority ar articulate what they're saying. Because minorities usually um, are saying something really different than everybody else. They're, they're the ones that um, are <coughs> experiencing something that really differs from others' experience in the community. And whenever there's an, an issue or a problem, it's that voice that's most needed. And it's the understanding of that voice that's most necessary towards resolvement. And if that voice can't find a way to articulate, can't be heard, can't be listened to, then we're all in trouble. So minority is really an important um, factor in terms of how our community uh, communicates and listen. So listening is the biggest part and finding ways to, to uh, bring forward those really out in the left field, so to speak, uh, kinds of ideas and voices. So Anaukan Wich describes that. It's a process in our community that describes uh, a process that, that makes that happen. We use it in our governance process. We use it in our in our community dialogues, when we use it in our family circles, our extended family meetings. And the idea isn't to make decisions. The idea is to hear all of the different aspects, all of the different views. So in an Alkin, we, we actually set up a, a, a dynamic in which that can happen. And in a dynamic which understands that there are polarities in community because there's diversity. And one of the, one of the ways we do that is we, we, we try to take the polarities in their larger sense and we give, them, we give them context in the community and we give them uh, authority in terms of that context in the community, which can't be usurped by any other by any other area of, of community. I'll just describe those four to you that, that we use in our community. Um, we, uh, what can, could be described in our language which is something similar to your idea of the elders, maybe, uh, although that's not really a correct uh, term in our language. It means those who have had long experience, um, and it doesn't mean in years, it really means the the teachings from the generations and generations and gener generations past. So you could be part of that group even if you're 20 years old or 10 years old or 
30 years old. Um, it's the knowledge that has been passed on to you and that you express and stand for that makes you in our language. And so you, your thinking and your concerns and your responsibilities are directed towards making sure that everything is remembered that is necessary to make things continue on in a healthy way. That, that group is usually uh, directly polarized against the group that uh, could be described as East, it's um, the, the, the youth, the younger generation, the young people. Um, we uh, think of those uh, in our language as not only people that are young, but people that have uh, a really great urge for innovation and cre creativity and new things, new ideas, new concepts. And that's always a dynamic that's really needed in, in any community, in any society, and really encouraged just as the elders and their bringing forward of all their teachings and immense knowledge is really encouraged. But those are the two that's usually a source of uh, opposition, oppositional um, dynamics. Uh, so one part of our Anaukanuik is, in it, is a real clear um, process in which those two speak to each other to inform each other and to clarify for each other. Part of our process for discussion in that Anaukanuik process is to something real simple. It's, it, it, you, you, you start with a concept that if there is a problem or a crisis or something that we're trying to resolve that we don't understand. Um, if anybody in this room um, already has all the answers and already knows it all, then they should have resolved it. <laughs> well, you know, why not? <laughs> you know, so therefore what that means then, nobody has all the answers. No one person should be arguing for their view, their position, their rightness or whatever. What it means then, everyone should be listening to try to understand what the other is saying and to try to incorporate into the overall solution what everyone is saying so that what everyone is saying, if it's brought together, will make more sense than what I'm saying. And obviously, I didn't resolve it, so what I'm saying isn't that important um, in, in terms of by itself. So that premise to begin with is a... Um, is a way in which uh, we uh, create the dialogue. We tell people, you're not, here to, you're not here to debate. You're not here to enforce your agenda. You're not here to convince me of what you think. You're here to listen and to hear the most diverse and opposite view to yours and to understand where it's coming from and why it's there and why that opinion is important in terms of how in we make a solution. You are responsible for doing that. You are responsible for hearing what is the most opposite to your opinion and finding a way to try to incorporate the other's diversity, the other's difference, and embrace that in terms of what we collectively make as a solution so that that difference is no longer a difference. It becomes part of what we are and who we are. And so, in terms of uh, the other two dynamics that exist in the community, there's uh, what we call, in our language, the male. Um, in our language, we don't have, in our uh, pronoun structure, we don't have a word that is like he or she. Um, and it's quite um, a difficult thing to speak English language because everything is sort of, you know, gender sort of based in that way. And I, I talked with my mother about it, my aunt, uh, Jeanette, who I'm named after, and both are medicine women. And I asked them, well, how come we don't have that? And uh, my, my aunt looked at me and she said, well, it has nothing to do with the person. <laughs> you know, what, what does it have to do with the person? <laughs> She said, if you were to say he or she in our language, you'd have to point to their genitals. You know? You'd have to 
point to what's between the legs. She said, and why would you do that? Why would you, <laughs> why would you talk about a person and point between their legs? <laughs> you know, she, she said, it doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't. It doesn't. People are what they do and who they relate to and how they relate to the world. And it has nothing to do with gender except that there's males and females. So the word is more like male and female. and The word actually has to do with how we understand in our philosophy how things work in the world. Because you'd say the cosmology of things. The way that we dis the word it's constructed for the male is the spreading outward of life as human, the spreading outward of our life form as human. The, that's the word that we use for male. Tamih uh, is the spreading outward of the life, diversity of life on the land. And for the, for the male, it's Skaltamih, meaning the one who's able to dream and able to spread outward the life of the human. And so that aspect or that idea of uh, procreation and the male and uh, the energy behind that is understood as a part of uh, what, what the male is. And, and in the same way, the, the female, the word for female in our language is tkilmilu. Uh, and it actually is a really interesting word uh, in terms of what I heard here earlier today. Um, the idea of the separating of the part of the skin of the community, um, the separation into family, is tkhmilu. That understanding of tklem uh, means separating out, and milu um, is the the covering of the community, the skin of the community. That's the whole of the of the people, the family systems, in other words. So, when the family system and the, uh, the um, which is represented by the female, and the male, which is represented by how the land operates, intersect. Um, the work that, uh, that has to be done um, to, um, to create uh, balance is to make sure that there's clear understanding between those two dynamics. How the, how the family um, and people in the family uh, are related to each other based on how they feel about each other, how they treat each other. What society is is about feeling, how we care about one another, how we love one another, how we protect one another, how we need to make sure there's food for everyone, how we need to make sure that everyone has, you know, warmth and shelter, and, and how everyone is nurtured emotionally, how you uh, make people feel good, how you celebrate. All of those aspects are what is understood to be under that that uh, the female. And the other aspects of uh, the tmih, the land, the uh, understanding of that is that all of the things that are structurally on the land, all of the living things and all of the things that are required to make shelter, to get food, to develop uh, all kinds of ways in organizing for that and doing that um, are all about how things are done, how things get done. In other words, the actions that it takes. So it's action-based. That's why that's spreading out in that word. Everything becomes an action that has to be undertaken, that has to be done. When actions are undertaken and when they're done, they have consequences. In other words, what you do impacts people, right? And if you do things without thinking and understanding and knowing how it impacts people, you can do a lot of things that are destructive. And you do do a lot of things that are destructive, thinking that you're doing it in the name of good or the name of providing and the name of prosperity. And if the male aspect gets you know, um, its way, that's what it'll do. It'll just keep doing that because that's, that's uh, what... In our society, um, we think of as patriarchy, 
right? The patriarchal model is where, you know, it, it doesn't matter that there's people starving. It doesn't matter that there's people hurting. It doesn't matter that there's minorities that are voiceless, you know, that are not being included, that are ex being excluded. Um, as long as we keep this thing going, so some of the people can get good out of it and, and some of the people can get privilege out of it. <laughs> and so that part, I think, um, is really one of the dynamics that you're talking about here, as well as the other two dynamics, but the dynamic of the male and the female aspects of community where nurturing and caring for and providing for the feelings, the, the generations to come, uh, are part of the doing continuously and that there's clear understanding and there's cooperation and collaboration between both. I'm getting close to what I'm going to end up with here in terms of family systems. That kind of dialogue we call an Aukenwich. You cannot sit down and have in our community any kind of rational um, decision or any kind of rational action unless you include all of those four aspects of dialogue in a deep listening process. If you do, you're endangering the whole community. If you do, you're excluding parts of the community. And in doing that, you are taking a vast risk for the next generations. And I think that's something that, uh, for me, really resonates here in that uh, we think about how we can continuously give our view, our diverse view, our most opposite opinion, and we think about how we have to listen for the others and how we, we are, have to be responsible in putting that together. In terms of the family systems, there is two things that operate within community that I think is important to mention here before I, before I finish here. One is the idea that family systems like the community is a living organism. We think about it as a body, a whole family system as a body, and that it's incomplete if that whole family system isn't intact. Uh, the nuclear family isn't what I'm talking about. The extended family of three, four generations, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmas, grandpas, great grandmas, grand aunts, and so on, um, as the repository of a whole lot of skills in terms of how to do community, how to be community, and how to be community on the land in terms of how, how you treat the land and how you take care of it and how you take care of each other without destroying it and how you move that along. And so family systems, if they're fragmented, into non-family systems, because I, I don't count a nuclear family as a family. Um, it's a mother and father and children, and um, even they don't stay together in, in this society. They, there's a diaspora f because of the market economy. You have to move over here for a job. You have to move over there or around the, round, you know, around the other end of the world. And so family really doesn't exist. It does not exist. There is a yearning for it and a hunger for it and a need for it, a much deeper need than we think and that we know. Um, in, in terms of our indigenous community, family is survival, is the basis of survival. And you cannot operate community without family. Community doesn't exist without extended family systems. Otherwise, it's just a collection of strangers, people that are not cooperating, not collaborating, not loving each other, not taking care of each other over generations and generations and learning how to do that on the land. So there's no communities either. And so one of the things about giving, and I'll give you some, just some quick examples about that in family systems. Our family systems in our communities are cl like clan systems. And each family system, extended family system, usually has um, a role of work in the community. Just like maybe something like the, the lo long ago, the guilds in Europe, 
uh, where you had the bakers and the millers and, you know, so on and so on. And huge families passed down that, you know, skill to the next family, and they, they used that skill to contribute to the community. Well, in our system, those extended families are the repositories of different kinds of skills. There are medicine families. There are the, uh, the uh, healer families. Medicine families and healer families usually are similar, but one you could say are uh, biologist, ethnobotanist, uh, the healer families. Uh, the medicine families are the psychologists, psychiatrists, um, and uh, usually uh, part of the chief's family belongs to that because they have to be psychologists and psychiatrists. And they, the uh, chief's families and then the um, people that are hunter families or fishermen or basket makers and so on. Um, those families all have people in them that are uh, conversant with all of those different um, tools that our community needs to uh, continue on its, its uh, life cycles. One of the things about gift giving in ours is we're very similar in our traditions to the West Coast tradition in that we have a huge number of feasts during the year. Um, my mother was a uh, longhouse leader, a winter dance leader, we call it in our community, because, of course, we don't have big cedars like the West Coast, or so we have short houses. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, winter dances uh, in the winter time. And the winter dances are similar to the, the, the smokehouse, big house dances on the West Coast in that they're giveaways. Um, and I grew up with my uncle uh, being a medicine man, my mother being a medicine woman, and a winter house leader, dance leader. Um, all of our extended families uh, spent all year long, cousins, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren, gathering and making and putting aside things that are to be given away during that winter dance. And every year during that winter dance, your mother gives away everything she owns. And without question, without choosing, without deciding how that's, who it's to be given to, it's simply given in a 10-day ritual of, of dance. And th that I saw all my life. And I, that I was brought up with all my life. Uh, we were told by my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, my uncles that that um, giving is the only way to be human. That if you don't know that giving is essential to survival, then you haven't been civilized yet. That you don't know how to be human yet. And that we're told that once we understand, when, we, when we're growing up, once we understand when we're like two or three years old, the very first things we're taught is to give in, in those ceremonies. The very first things that we're shown how to do is to give. That when we receive something that we really cherish and we really like and we really care about, that's the first thing we should give. Because our community is to be cherished on that level. Our people and our land is to be cherished on that level. And... Um, if you don't know how to give like that, you're poor. You're in poverty. You might hoard all the things that you think your family or your community or your business needs, but you're poor. My mother used to, we used to drive through some of the cities, and she'd look out there and she'd say, those poor people, those poor, poor people, And she meant it. She wasn't being ironic or sarcastic. She was pointing out what they were missing out on. She was pointing out what they are hungry for and what they're trying to find in accumulating and hoarding and being selfish. She was pointing out what is really, really given to you when you reverse that and what you feel when you give. You all know that feeling. When you, when you give of purity, you all know how good it makes you feel and how great 
it makes you as a person inside. You all know that feeling. That is a natural feeling to us as humans. That is the real feeling of being human. And we all feel that when we do that. Christmas time, everybody's so excited about getting and giving and giving, you know, and some people go overboard. Where do you think that feeling comes from? When we give to our loved ones, you know, we're used to just giving to our favorite chosen loved ones in this outer society without realizing that you feel the same in giving, whether it's your direct blood relative or whether it's a stranger absolutely not known to you. The feeling is the same. And in one of our laws, we're told that uh, when we start understanding that principle and we start working with that principle and we source that principle, we, in other words, we lead our lives by giving continuously, never ever thinking about what you get back from it or exchanging it for some, something that you want somebody to do for you. In fact, that's not called giving in our language. In our language, that's called something else. We, we call it kamila. There's no word for greed in our language that I could, we've, I've tried to find a word for greed in our language, and there isn't a word. What we found instead is that word kamila, and we use it to mean a person that, uh, you know, is uh, expecting to get something back uh, or expecting to have more than another and expecting to eat more than another, you know. And, and uh, we describe uh, people as becoming that and we call them an ethna in our language. And what that means is a destructor of people, destroyer of people. Um, and uh, in our traditions, we had um, a way uh, to be able to describe that because what Kamila means is to be able to stop the giving. Ka means to stop and Mil means to give. You give out. It goes out to whoever, ever, wherever it goes. Ka Mila means to stop the giving, to put an obstacle between the giving and yourself. And so we describe a person as Kamila if, you know, if they want more for themselves or they want more for their family or if they, you know, in some way act as an obstacle by being selfish to the rest of everybody getting what, you know, is, is necessary and needed and deserved by them. Um, in terms of someone's talk on languages here, um, I want to tell you that my language is uh, one of the languages that's on the uh, brink of extinction. And these words that I'm describing to you are immensely important words that uh, belong um, in the understanding of our humanity and that are necessary and needed in the understanding of what needs to be done to change. And um, in our way, we're not, uh, we, we, are, we are always told not to ask for anything. We're always told in, in our community as a practice that when you start asking for something, that's when you're agreeing that people are being irresponsible in not understanding what your need is, not seeing what your need is, and not making sure that they have moved their resources and their actions toward making sure that need isn't there. Because that's the responsibility of people that surround you. So you, you you, in our community, you cannot ask. You cannot go to a person and say, I, I want you to do this for me, or I want you to do that for me. All you can do is clarify for them what is happening and what the consequences are in, in your family or your community or in, on your land. Clarify for them and, and clarify for them what, what needs to be done and how it needs to be done and then it's up to them. And if they fall short of that responsibility, that at some point they will face the same need themselves, that they will be in that kind of need. And we're told on a spiritual level that when we give, and you can try this in your own life, when you give uh, freely without asking for anything back, um, whatever it might be, especially 
the things that are really difficult for you to give, um, that you receive back the equivalent of four times uh, what, whatever it is that you gave. Um, and and uh, the simple exercise that my mother used to tell me, uh, she used to tell me, whatever you, you have to work now to, in order to put food on the table, whatever you work for, you keep you know, a, a small amount, enough to put food on the table and enough to get you back and forth to work, and you give all the rest away. And uh, you make sure you continue to do that every year. And you'll never have to worry about your work. You'll never have to worry about you know, all of the things that you need to cover that. And I never have. Um, and I do that every year in, of my life, all the time, uh, to my community, to my people, to strangers, to everything that I do. If I were asked to come here to speak on, on this topic without, without the, the giving of the organizers here, um, and I saw that it was uh, something that could be uh, given to change the way things happen, I would find a way to give that. I would find a way to come here to do that. And I have done that and practiced that. And I think that's something that uh, is needed in terms of how we do things. I think that's something that needs to be understood in terms of our personal. So I've taken it from the land to the community to the family to the personal level. It comes down to each person embodying that and practicing that and doing that without let up. It comes down to each person being human in that way. Thank you. Jen last year in Luxembourg when there was the first World Congress of Matriarchal Studies and she gave me her book. And I must say I, I am really deeply impressed by this book, Forgiving, because of the clarity and depth of her analysis of a person who speaks out of her whole life experience and reflection, a, a mixture of being mother, a lover, a very good thinker, everything together. And I was really deeply impressed, and I think this is exactly what we needed at the moment, this deep analysis of our situation. Now, when I heard Jeanette Armstrong just before the break, I felt, asha I fe felt ashamed of having done so little compared to the size of the problem, because we don't know where the exit is. We didn't prevent patriarchy from developing so far, we women. And so I think this is, we have to do that now. Jen says in her book, in order to reject patriarchal thinking, we must be able to distinguish between it and something else, an alternative. This is what I'm trying to do. She says we should try to think outside patriarchy, but I feel we also have to think inside patriarchy because if not, we don't understand it. I never understood patriarchy. This is why I started to study it and I just founded the Innsbruck Institute for Research on Patriarchy because... <laughs> <laughs> and also I hope, um, as Jen said, she was, never, she was never inside the academics that she um, remained naive. And I, uh, even though I have been inside the academic world for many time, for much time, I hope to have uh, remained naive too, in a way. I hope so, at least. So I don't have to add anything to the gift paradigm, but I have to add something to the analysis of patriarchy. A radically worldview is possible and I think also a radically different world is possible, not only the view, but the world as such. Therefore, my analysis turns around capitalist patriarchy and the struggle for a deep alternative. 
I think that this different worldview is necessary because today we are observing a global social, economical, ecological and political development that is totally different from what it is supposed to be. The so-called globalization obviously is not a movement towards more democracy, peace, general welfare, wealth and ecological sustainability as it propagates Propagators are pretending everywhere. On the contrary, the opposite is true. Never in history have so many people died from hunger and thirst, environmental destruction and war, most of them women and children. Never in history has the technological process led to such an intense and threatening destruction of the environment globally. Never in history has the nuclear threat been so acute. Never in history have the political systems been changing so clearly into the direction of an authoritarian, if not despotic rule in many parts of the world. And never in history has such a tiny minority on the globe been so incredibly rich and powerful like the transnational corporations and their global players of today, for whom we and the planet are nothing else but their play material. In sum, this situation can be called the development of underdevelopment but this time, under development is not only produced in the South, but also in the North. It is the result of a new colonization of the world, which did and does not happen inexplicably, but is actively and aggressively promoted by the governments as their general and apparently normal policy, beginning in the 80s of the 20th century. This policy consists in a continuing process of primitive accumulation that leads to a forced economic growth through the direct expropriation of the peoples of the globe and the globe itself. The name of this policy is neoliberalism, and this new liberalism fits except exclusively to the interests of the corporations. For the rest of humanity, it means just the opposite, namely totalitarianism. Is this new world order the best of all possible worlds Western civilization pretends to develop? Or is the current development of Western civilization the peak and turning point towards its final decline? Meanwhile, many people have made a description of the situation and its dynamics. There, it seems to be no future astonishingly enough even for the global players themselves. I call this situation West End in process. The self-given license to loot the resources of the Earth will find an end with the end of the resources already underway. And the resource wars, the new wars on the globe for oil and water that have already begun are just a logical consequence. But there is nearly no deeper analysis of the reasons that are leading to this extraordinary situation and its dynamics that seem to exclude any alternative. There is no real explanation of the world's dilemma and its causes that is deep enough. I suppose that the reasons why most people do not really know why all these things are happening is due to the fact that the left as well as the right and the sciences in general have never analyzed patriarchy. And not knowing patriarchy also means not really knowing capitalism because the, do, the two do not only share a time of being together on this earth for now 500 years, but of being deeply related to each other in a way that has not been understood by most people until today, even feminists. Therefore, it is time to do the necessary step, analyzing capitalist patriarchy from its roots and as a theoretical concept for the analysis of society. Only then it can be seen that patriarchy is much more than just a word for polemical purposes, but it can be understood as a concept that explains the character of the whole social order in which we are living today. Recent studies of matriarchal societies suggest mainly three things. First, patriarchal society as we know it did not exist as such and independently from or even before the matriarchal one, but started to develop after the armed invasion, violent conquest and systematic destruction of matriarchal society by armed hordes that had lost their own originally matriarchal culture after having been exposed to catastrophic migration. This process is reported from the fifth millennium before Christ onwards 
and it occurred in China, India, the Middle East, North and Central Africa, Europe, and the Americas as well. As patriarchal society did not, did not exist as such, we have to analyze the conditions that led, led to its development. The development of patriarchal society is related to the invention of something that from then on was called war. And the development of patriarchy has been dependent on the continuation of war, even in so-called peace times. Otherwise, the people of the conquered communities and societies would have easily liberated themselves from the conqueror's rule. The logic of patriarchy since then is the logic of war, which means that all the social institutions invented by patriarchy are principally drawn from war experiences. A, patriarchy invented a political system based on the invention of the state, which meant the hierarchical dominance of armed men over the conquered people and the dominance of men over women because women were at the center of pre-patriarchal society and felt responsible for the maintenance of its egalitarian principles. B, patriarchy invented an economy based on the invention of the plunder of other people's property, from then on called private property, from private, that means to rob, and on an always more systematical exploitation of the conquered through exchange, all of which caused the impoverishment, especially of the women, because women had control over the means of production, were the producers, distributors, and givers of concrete wealth, namely life, food, security, and the integration of everybody into the community. C. Patriarchy invented a society split into social classes, races, generations, and genders, what meant from then on, especially women, were regarded as being subjected to men by nature in order to never be able again to reestablish a matriarchal society. D, patriarchy invented a godfather or male creator religion based on the image of the great warrior, plunderer, proprietor, or big man who was regarded to be able and to be legitimized to give and to take life like the great mother or goddess herself replacing her by the idea or ideology of an omnipotent, violent, and jealous single god, a sort of an abstract patriarchal mother-father. E, patriarchy invented a technology based on the war as the father of all things, namely by beginning to transform the pre-patriarchal technique and philosophy of alchemy into a patriarchal one, what meant that from then on, men systematically tried to use the existing female knowledge about life and nature in order to appropriate it, to pervert it into a means of control over life and nature, and finally to overcome the dependence on nature and women by trying to replace them through technological progress, the project of a sort of second creation. And F, Patriarchy invented a psychology that defined the ways how men could develop their masculation, as Jen says, their competitive patriarchal egological individuality opposing women, the community, and nature. In sum, the patriarchal order of society meant a total break with matriarchal or gift-giving social rules, traditions, and taboos from times immemorial and can be defined as a war system in development. And even if there have been times and spaces that did not fit at all into this picture, the development or so-called evolution, namely that of patriarchy, nevertheless in the last instances has been a continuous one. And women did not prevent patriarchy from developing further until today. Second um, definition, part of, definition of defining patriarchy. In patriarchal societies, we can always find rests of the former matriarchal ones that is called matriarchy as second culture, left over or newly reorganized after the patriarchs had started to negate the reality and quality of matriarchal society. This second culture can be observed everywhere, for example, in mother-child relationships, in love, or generally in gift-giving. It contradicts the patriarchal order, but also helps it to exist because a society without any matriarchal relations could simply not survive. 
Therefore, patriarchies are always somehow mixed societies, be it to a higher or lower degree, and they, for obvious reasons, are hiding this fact as much as they can. But today, it can be observed very clearly that patriarchy is trying to complete its negation of matriarchy in order to replace it as much as possible. This destruction and the fading away of the second culture in patriarchy, it could be argued, is one of the main reasons for the depth of the crisis of the contemporary civilization. The negation of matriarchy as such consisted and consists in presupposing that there has never been any matriarchal society, that patriarchal society existed from the beginning of human life on earth, and or pretending that a violent and evil rule of women had to be broken before patriarchal society could develop so-called civilization and progress. Due to this patriarchal mythology, most people today still think that matriarchy, never, matriarchy did never exist, or that it meant rule of women instead of rule of men, which indeed never was the case in matriarchal, but maybe sometimes in patriarchal society. So most people do not understand that the terms matriarchy and patriarchy are not just referring to men and women, or male and female, but to the character of the whole social order, so that both men and women living in matriarchy have to be considered matriarchal, and living in patriarchy both have to be considered principally patriarchal, referring to their thinking, acting, and feeling. Furthermore, the negation of matriarchy consisted and consists in destroying the matriarchal society as a social order on its own, appropriating everything from matriarchal society that seemed important to the patriarchs, trying to usurp it, especially the image and the abilities of the mother and the goddess, because patriarchy did not have an originally owned culture. And perverting everything matriarchal into its opposite, which is the way how the patriarchal is defined. Then, trying to transform the originally matriarchal society into a patriarchal one by developing the policies of divide and rule, by dissolving and abstracting the interconnectedness of people, communities, and nature in general, and by subsequently trying to replace them by a purely patriarchal world. Especially this last question, namely of the transformation and substitution of nature women and their social order have never nearly been have nearly never been regarded in their crucial importance third part of definition of patriarchy people's experiences with patriarchal society war despotic rule and ceaseless violence logically led to a complete change in the general world view too the gnostic worldview appeared Gnosis means recognition. It is recognized that the world is bad, evil, low, primitive, violent, sinful, and not worth living in it. A better, higher, more developed, noble, and civilized world, therefore, is becoming the ideal of people in patriarchy. But it is believed that this higher world cannot be found on earth, less in the matriarchal past or presence elsewhere. So the higher world is thought of as a metaphysical world that can only be envisioned by imagination. A metaphysical world beyond physics was not thought of in matriarchal society because the words mater and archi together do not mean rule of mothers, but in the beginning the mother. Life stems from mothers, uterus. Therefore, life, death, the mother and the goddess are always here in this world, and they all belong to each other so that there is neither the need nor the idea of another metaphysical world beyond the one in which we are living every day. In patriarchal society, on the contrary, <laughs> in patriarchal society, on the contrary, another world beyond the existing one has to be invented because the words pater and archi together do not simply mean rule of fathers, Heide, where is she? But in the beginning, a so-called father, a word unknown in matriarchal times, by the way, or life stems from fathers instead of from mothers. Fathers are men with uteruses who, in the last instance, are able to give life themselves 
without needing women at all. For example, the pharaoh Eshnaton, for example, made himself be painted as a pregnant man. Only on the basis of this fantasy, men would be legitimized to rule over those who are not fathers, that is, the people and especially the mothers. The father, therefore, is defined as somebody who is a ruling man and as such not only able to take life, but also to give life. In patriarchy, the words are key. The word archi thus did not only mean beginning, origin, uterus, but also rule and domination too. The second meaning of archi did not appear before patriarchy, so that in matriarchy, archi would never have meant domination, much less mothers or women's rule. There simply was no domination and therefore there was no word for it. This means that the political system of patriarchal society can be regarded as a first step into the direction of the, develop, of the development of a pure, fully realized patriarchy in which the fathers would be men with uteruses or with something like uterus machines. So the political system of patriarchy would only be needed as a method for the period in which patriarchy moves towards its realization, in which it is on its way towards a real patriarchy conceived of as the end of history. From this point of view, it is only five minutes. From this point of view, history is only the time in which patriarchy appeared and developed until it became 100% reality. The patriarchal usurpation, destruction and perversion of the mother and the wish to replace her thus led to an early sort of science fiction, namely to the idea that what is only and absurdly supposed, namely that life stems from the father and not from the mother, is considered even more real than what can be experienced every day, namely the opposite. Gnostic metaphysics and the belief in it as another higher reality are appearing everywhere, in every theological as well as philosophical tradition until today. Since then, belief has become more important than knowledge, even more so in the secularized modern sciences of today. In sum, the historically new concept of the father is a triple fiction. It imitates the fiction of a powerful patriarchal mother or goddess and imagines to have successfully replaced her. This way the father is defined as a sort of patriarchal mother, the god as a sort of patriarchal goddess who as a complete antagonism could never have before have been thought of. But the fiction is program. The idea of patriarchy has become its political and technological project. Patriarchy as a society in which life stems from fathers and not from mothers has to be artificially produced or it will never exist. The project is life or what is considered to be life should be born or be made by men. So only, only when men have become real fathers, patriarchal society would in the long run not have to fear women and matriarchal key or the gift paradigm as another alternative any longer. Now I have to, to be very short. So having defined patriarchy this way, what does it mean for defining capitalism? From my analysis of patriarchy follows that capitalism is nothing else but the latest stage of patriarchy. My hypothesis is that patriarchy crystallizes into capitalism. This means that with capitalism, there is a break with, as well as a continuation of patriarchy, both even going to the same direction, namely fostering patriarchy. The logics of patriarchy led straight forward into the modern epoch because capitalism is the promise to finally realize the futuristic Gnostic utopia materially and on earth. It consists in the intent to produce a purely patriarchal society, cleaned from matriarchal rests whatsoever and propagated as a man-made perfect second paradise. Metaphysics are to become the new physics. This is the propaganda of modern society as a whole. This is the beginning of the great transformation for which modern Europe 
has become so famous. The idea is that we, what we can see today everywhere, that nature women and their order has to be replaced by the artificial products of industry, namely gifts by exchange, subsistence by commodities, foreign cultures by Western culture, concrete wealth by money, machinery and capital, the new abstract wealth, living labor by machines, the brain by artificial intelligence, women by sex machines, real mothers by mother machines, and life in general by artificial life, like genetically modified organisms, and generally by what I call the chemical system of an industrial life production. Therefore, the so-called technological progress through the development of modern sciences and the invention of the machine as a totally new techno system has been the logical backbone of modern patriarchal epoch. And the invention of the profit that could be drawn out of this adventure of transformation of the whole world has convinced always more people, mostly men. But with all this progress, as we know, Mother Earth is going to be more and more destroyed. We know that nuclear and genetic changes are already irre irreversible. So capitalism, with its activism, optimism, positivism, rationality, and its irrational belief in violence is not just capitalism, but has to be defined as capitalist patriarchy. One minute. But if the matter of capitalism, its martyr, its mothers, its women, its patriarchal rests do not obey anymore, and if nature does not as well, only then will capitalist patriarchy be disappearing. And as capitalist patriarchy is obviously not a society for eternity, this is going to happen now. <laughs> if, I, if I am allowed, I just wait, wanted to, to take some points of what is going to happen in this sense. So patriarchal institutions will have to be deconstructed. The metaphysical Gnostic worldview, its religion, materialism, and idealism will have to be given up. Instead, the interconnectedness of life has to be recognized as the basis for a post-patriarchal spirituality. Economic and technological progress cannot be defined as having to produce value or profit and machinery as substitutes for life, nature, and women any longer. The paradise that is supposed to be invented is already here. It is our Earth herself, the most wonderful living planet in the universe. Except in this, we suddenly will have to, to do a lot in order to prevent this still existing paradise from disappearing forever. For example, the Congo, as the World Bank has started to cut jungles in the heart of Africa, we have to become active in order to stop this destruction of a whole continent. Men and women have to, be, have to liberate themselves from the idea and the delusion that life on Earth is unimportant, a mere illusion, Maya, and something that has, or can be, has to be or can be replaced by something else. They have to learn the lessons of nature again. We will have to know instead of believe. We will have to learn that destruction does not lead to a better world, but to destruction. We will have to learn that there is no truth in violence. We will have to learn that there is no happiness in egotism and so on. And last but not least, what is needed is a reversion of a perverted parasitic society and mankind, the patriarchal mother-father as a cyborg that is the alchemical materialization of a metaphysical fiction has to fade away as soon as possible. Thank you.